please welcome to the show Lori Miller. Lori. Hey, I'm moving my camera. Sorry. That's okay. Hey, you know, everything that I've learned about you, because uh, look, I, I guess well, we'll get into this story, but everything I've learned about you now recently, anticipating our talk, I'm not surprised you'd be adjusting the camera. You know, you seem to be a person who cares about those things. And uh, as a creative person and a person with an eye, you know, for detail and beauty and, you know, that you'd be composing your shot even here at the last minute here. Yes. That makes sense to me. I got to tell you, so, you know, we did this episode, I've already meant to, mentioned on the show you were going to come on because we did that episode about expose and we talked to the, you know, the three ladies that are expose. I want to say currently, but it, it sounds. They are. They, they're expose now. I mean, they yeah. went to court, they fought for the name, they own the name and they are expose today. Yes. It sounds like maybe there's going to, like Menudo, there might be another expose yeah. in a few years, but, but Most I was so. I don't know. That's true. I was so excited that uh, you reached out, though, um, to, and look, just to be direct, you reached out because you wanted to make sure I had the whole story. And I want Yes, the whole story. but I saw the picture. I saw you saying you were going to do an interview, but I saw our picture. And I was yeah. like, you know you got the wrong picture, right? <laughs> like that's the original. Like, what's going on? And then I listened to it, and I was really thankful that you did that, even though you didn't address it with them, which I would have loved to hear their response mm -hmm. um you i i really appreciate it and i know it was somebody that you were co-hosting with you was right. that violet violet, violet was, and yeah. i know she's very familiar and we're friendly so right. yeah i was appreciative and then I, it was you were so nice like you called me right back so it was oh my god fun. i was so scared like i thought <laughs> I, I was trying to do this thing because obviously, look, I really appreciate the fact what you did and I wanted to know and, and then to have you reach out. I thought, oh, no, I screwed something up. So I was so desperate to get a hold of you. But, you know, you mentioned the interview that I didn't mention it to the, to the other ladies. And quite honestly, it's because I could tell there's pieces missing. And I didn't in the 80s vernacular want to start any beef or static. Uh, so this is that's why I, this is especially great that I can hear it because you were there. They weren't even there for the that sort of this, this transition. So I don't know that they could tell me the whole story like you could. This is true because I know Jeanette has spoken about it recently, only recently, because for years they had a website and I went on and tried to talk to the guy who was running it. I can't remember the name, Apostle Expose. There's like some kind of a like a, it was up there for a while. And I was like, don't you want to know? And he goes, oh, there was no expose before this expose. I said, that's oh. not true. And he made me feel bad. He was like, you're, you know, you're full of shit. I don't know what you're talking wow. about. So, and I'm like, well, this is the truth. I'm telling you what happened. I'm not trying to say anything bad about Jeanette or Joy or Anne, but you know, there was three girls who got the album deal right. and tour and were together for almost four years, working our asses off to get yeah. that deal. For nobody to acknowledge it now, yeah. it's like, it's just not, it's not right. I'm not looking for money or yeah. anything. Just like tell the story the way it is. And that's one thing that I've never quite understood, you know, and that at one point they were calling themselves the original expose. And I actually, at that point said, you know what? I really, I don't think you should say that. I talked to their management. I said, because you're not the original expose. And if you're not going to say the truth, at least don't right. come in now and say and lie about it. Not that right. they're, they didn't feel like they were lying. You know, they were they were trying to decipher because there's been many incarnations of the group, you know. So mm -hmm. it was Ali, myself, and Sandra were the original lineup. There's actually another Lori there before me, and I was right. the choreographer and the stylist. And then I ended up joining the group to act as, like, sort of the on-site person that did the hair, the makeup, the staging, the lighting, the speaking, the you know, all that so, stuff because I had the theatrical background. I want to find out how you even got there. So uh, you're, you're a young person growing up, you know, what sparked your interest in, and look, you're designing now and you've been designing for years, whether it was uh, part of Princess Cruises yeah. or now at your current work with the jewelers. Um, you were doing designing then, you know, as you mentioned, you did the costumes, uh, makeup, et cetera, for the, for the ladies. At what point then were you interested in seeing? Was it something that predated that even, or was it? Yes. Well, my mother was very, and my dad were both involved in theater. My dad uh, did lighting and sound, and my mom oh. directed. She did all the musicals at the Hollywood Playhouse, um, and I grew up in Florida. And when I was, like, sort of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, and I was 
not a bad kid. I was always been into yoga and I was vegetarian and all that back in the seventies. I'm much older now, but before it was like the thing. And um, my mom to keep an eye on me, put me in a, put me in um, one of her shows called sweet charity to just sure. keep me near her. And once I got in that show and I was in the chorus in that show, I was like, this is, <laughs> this just resonated, you know, like I got on stage and I realized I could sing and I was really actually a shy kid. I, and I never really, I always just wanted to be with my mom and I just was always artistic, but I never knew that I could sing. Right. And then I, when, um, before that, oh my God, there's such, there's so much to it. But my mom actually brought me into a dance class when I was uh, much younger and I got a scholarship at June Taylor School of Dance up in Fort Lauderdale. Wow. So I was dancing and my first gig, I actually got picked up right out of class for going to go on tour, to go to Spain with a gentleman named Frankie Kane. And he impersonated Liza Minnelli and Julie Andrews and he's incredible. And we went to Spain and we played in the in Madrid and Teatro Victoria. And then we were in Barcelona and then we were there for about three months. And that was my first introduction. So I wasn't singing then, but I was going out to clubs at night and singing and sitting in and doing jazz gigs because I really like jazz. And so how, how old were you at that point? Um, that was the 70s, early 70s. I have to do the math. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't that young. I started late, actually. Okay. I started singing to my 20s. And, I, and okay. when I was in expose, I was in my early 30s. Is that and right? now it's like 30 years later. So I'm in my 60s. Wow. Yeah. I can't believe that. I'm actually 66. Come on yeah. now. It's crazy. That See, is insane. Don't eat animals. You'll be healthier. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm in trouble. I can that I'm older. I mean, I feel great. And I still have a lot of energy. And I still, you know, have a lot. That I feel like I want to do, and um, so I was in the Frankie Kane show, and then I got um, a chance to audition for Miller Reese. She was in the show at the Sheridan Bell Harbor with a singing spot, and so they really liked me. So they gave me my own little feature. I wasn't the lead singer, but I was a dancer who sang, covered dancer, by the way, and mm -hmm. and I loved it. And it was amazing music. I was with jo Joan Pale Thorpe, and the choreography was incredible. And you know, I was legit. I, I had studied jazz dancing right. and I, I was first chair clarinet all through junior high school. So I was uh, competing with like 18 other clarinet. And I think all that training, even though because I started singing later, I think playing and being able to read music and playing in an orchestra like that really trained my ear. Sure. And it's just, it's in my family music. Yeah. You know, I just grew up with all that great music. Frank Sinatra, Nelson Riddle, Count Basie, and my dad just always had a huge stereo system. And my parent, my mom sang in a group and played piano, played clarinet. So it's always, you know, I just never thought I I would watch my mom would be the lead in all these musicals. And I, I remember watching her like being scared for her and say, mm. how can she get up there in front of all these people? Do that. And then I realized when she put me in the show and I finally, you know, got got up in front of, you know, played a character. It's like, oh, so you can be somebody else. So it's OK, you know, to be right exuberant and flamboyant and full so on. How, how do you go then from, you know, you said you're you're still relatively young, maybe in your teens, early 20s, traveling, dancing. Again, at what point does it transition, I suppose, into even having the opportunity or interest in singing, maybe professionally, you don't know what's going to happen. That's a real, you know, sort of, uh, this the arts, even theater, you know, that's a hard gig. Yeah. Uh, a hard job to keep getting, you know, gig after gig. Uh, at what that's point do you start getting the ambition for it? In the right place at the right time. You know, yeah. when my mom put me in that show and I, I felt that thing, you know, it's right. like, a, you know, you've been, you've done some theater, you get yeah. it in your blood and you just, you know, you just want it just want that experience, that exchange. Somebody once did a reading on me and said, oh, you've been doing this for centuries, the exchange <laughs> of Kundalini, the exchange of energy and conducting the room and doing that, you know, that sort of circular, you know, you feel like in a way, I think entertainers are healers in their own way because sure. you come in and you take them away from their reality for those moments that you can bring them in, you know, to your, to your world, to your story, to your experience yeah. of what you're doing there yeah, it's so, funny i i get uh, even doing this silly podcast you know where look it's silly to it, 
I say it's silly because in the grand context of what's happening in the world, it seems frivolous, you know, to talk about things I love from the 1980s. But to your point, in, with when we have that stuff happening in the world, you need these kinds of moments of, you know, levity and connection. And uh, Yeah, and reminiscing medicine. is like the best drug there is. When we yes. first started going through COVID, I went through all my old VHS tapes and transferred everything over, and I started this page and all... I was with Princess for 14 years. It was time of my life just sailing around the world, being a complete nomad, never in mm -hmm. one place, wow. right? And just do, having these big families of casts, you know, where we were all together uh, performing. And it's not the same now. I'm so glad I got to do that when I did. Yeah. And just to share that again and all of us reliving that. And it was just it was such a good feeling, you know, to go back and remember who you are and what you've done and what you've experienced and all the lessons learned. We it's did uh, share some research where you're, you're right. I mean, and, and to back it up biologically, like scientists and doctors saying that there's something about reminiscing that actually is healing and good for strong mental health. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it's physical health too, because you look great. You say you're 66. We, that's a question we don't know. But our research has doesn't bear that out yet. Well, I'm um, plant-based. So, I just want to put that out there. I don't eat any animals, and I have it for like mm -hmm. about seven or eight years now. And I was vegetarian for years before that. And I do a lot of yoga and qigong and uh, dancing and walking and cycling. And, you know, you just got to keep moving yeah. to keep everything working. Yeah, right? yeah and, 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 and you know, we'll get this in a moment, but and have an ambition for something, you know, to continue passion. to passion for something. So what, when's your first, again, I'm, I'm trying to nail down. So you're, as you're an adult, what's your first singing gig? It's not expose, right? Or exposed. No, I was, I did, um, my first gig was the Frankie Kane show where I wasn't okay. singing. I was but dancing you weren't singing yet. and I was an actress with them and it was incredible. His show was just incredible. If you look him up, I mean, he wasn't a drag queen. He was a female impersonator, mm -hmm. you know, and he was, a used to be an ice skater. So he was in, he could dance. I learned, I, I talk about this when I did my one woman show that I learned more from him about being a woman on stage, about being a performer than I learned from anybody else in my life. He was just the consummate performer. Um, and it was amazing. I just, you know, I learned as I, he picked me out of the, out of a group, you know, and believed in me. And I learned so much from that couple of years that I was with him. And then I went to Miller Reich and then I then I started getting a singing spot. So that was my first time that I was singing. But before that, I was still singing. I was like I said, I was when we would go out to clubs and I would sit in and do jazz and standards, American Stand Book, um, American Book of Standards. I love all that music because that's what I grew up with. And that that's, always really killed me. So when. OK, so I guess getting to moving towards expose, we know that expose was a oh, group. Okay. So after I did, am I Miller, jumping too ahead, far ahead? No, no, I'm. I, I see what you're trying to get the timeline of how it. Yeah, how it, yeah. It, it's curious to me, uh, you know, just as a base sort of thing. It's curious to me how folks, especially in the arts, come to doing those things because. I don't think. Yeah, I we I didn't plan it. I didn't yeah. even know it was an accident. So I was doing corporate gigs with a good friend of mine, Ken Samuels, who was also my dance teacher, and his sister Sue Samuels teaches at the Dance Factory in New York City. And I was with him for years down in Florida. And um, I he was doing big corporate events. So we did a lot of audience participation and we played characters, which also mm -hmm. like every step of the way, you may not think that it's going to add like well, to, up to you having a career. Right. But all those things add to your abilities of being able to read a crowd and know how to interact with people and know how to when to turn left or turn right. 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 And when I was in that class, the another girl who was there, Daria Melendez, she um, knew Frank Diaz, who's the executive producer for Expose. And he was actually looking for dancers for another group of his called Technolust. So okay, sure. he put, she connected me with him and I auditioned for Technolust and became Spice uh, in Technolust with her. So she was sugar, I was Spice. But... And that was with, um, oh, he'll kill me. I can't remember his name. He had a, oh, I'm not prepared, but it's in my bio. You'll read it in there. It's on my website. Um, he had a song called Woman. And 
then he thought, you know what, you know what, she she really needs to have a little thing because she's too strong to be spice behind me. Everybody's asking about spice, you know. So when Frank and Lewis put expose together, they asked me, and I Frank and I were dating at that time, so we had gotten together, and he was actually my fiance for a while. And he, um, when he was putting expose, he asked me about it, but I didn't really want to be in a group. I wanted to kind of do my own thing, but he asked me if I would do the choreography and stylize the group and work with him on putting it together. So I did. And then, um, and then I ended up loving it and loving Ali and Sandra and became part of the group it, with a promise that I would get to do my own thing, but it like took off. And we always had this argument, like what came first? Cause the song of course, right. Comes first. But every time we did a show, we were so synchronized and so choreographed that it just help the both of those together and who knew that I would just happen to be at that audition to meet Frank at that time that he was doing expose and we were called exposed at first right. and I was singing in a top 40 band at the same time as well called ecstasy so oh, when okay. I was, wasn't on stage doing top 40 I was also singing covering point in a return in the band because it was out for nine months before we ever got picked up I think it was about six months before they ever went out and started performing it and actually promoting it. Right. And so, and I guess just taking a step back. So, so, uh, Louis Martinet. Yes. From, uh, is the, is the he gentleman. Was, was Martinez at the time. But... Oh, okay. That explains it. So Louis <laughs> Martinez or Louis Martinet is the writer creator of, of the music that ultimately right. you sing as expose. He partners with Frank, who's with Pantera records. Their partners, oh, right? At who had a techno 40, lust 40 a, Studio, it was called. What was it called? 4040. 4040. Okay. Pantera Studios. Pantera, Pantera right. Yeah. Which had a number of different dance players. acts. Yeah, they had quite a few. They worked with quite a few. I mean, back then, the Miami scene was really happening, you know, and all that freestyle. And it, it was more than freestyle, but it was mainly like a, it was just coming out freestyle music. I think Shannon really started it. Sure. And then we were like right in there. We their, our timing was perfect, and Ali actually wasn't supposed to sing "Point in No Return." Sandra was, but she never showed up for the recording date. So Ali did the the mm -hmm. demo, and they did demo pressings. That's when they had vinyl, and right. well, we have vinyl again now. And they took that to the clubs, and everybody just loved it. I loved it. I really loved Ali's voice on that. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Like so, back then in the in the nineteen eighties. Songs like uh, Point of No Return wouldn't be on a top 40. They weren't on top 40 yet. And we know technically they didn't make it to the top 40 to a couple years later. But what we had were these club hits. And a lot of artists who made it mainstream started out that way. Madonna started out that way, you know, yeah. getting a hit in the clubs first. And, and same they thing with those. Go to the club with a cassette. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, play my tune, play my song just to test it, to see how it would yeah. go. And it was just. Was mm -hmm. killing it. And there was test pressings everywhere that all actually have my handwriting. So if you have a te test pressing, pressing with handwriting on it, it's me. Yeah. So that's wow. how back I go. Excuse that's me. a collector's item. <laughs> yeah. So, as you mentioned, the three ladies that with, with, we were with you, originally they're exposed. At, at some point when you get the, I think it's when you get the record deal, you change it to expose. But Arista record... changed it to expose when they signed us. So okay. David German really loved the record. He was A&R for... Um, Arista Records at the time, and right. he came down and saw us, and he convinced Clive that we should that he, they should pick this up, this twelve inch, and it just like we would go out every weekend. This is for like three or three and a half years. We went out like every weekend and did four or five shows, sometimes two shows a night. Right. That's a lot of work to put in, and then we did the whole album deal for somebody not to recognize. Yeah. Us. It wasn't like we were just the studio singers, you know, there was a lot. And then it all changed so fast. Nobody knew what happened and nobody ever talked about it. There was cease and desist. I couldn't say I was formally of. And so there was when, when you say you're playing out, just so folks know, you're not just performing Miami where this group was born. No, we went you're, to you're... York, Chicago, California. I really, the fans out of California, I think really put us on the map. Mm really make a difference it is interesting to me you know you talked about freestyle music so freestyle music was born in the 1980s you know it is this evolution of it has some hip-hop elements in, in miami it has more latin elements mm -hmm. a lot of it is latin uh, created by latin folks um 
and like you said, early in the 80s, we had some different sort of styles of it. But as it got closer to later in the 80s, it became more like the sound of expose. But it's yeah. curious to me how, you know, the middle of the country, a lot of the middle of the country didn't even know about this music. You know, it was, it was Miami, New York, L.A., maybe Chicago. But otherwise, you know, folks. That was the first time I ever got chased by. In Chicago? Yeah, we were, when we left the group, the car was kind of a little bit away and we were walking and all of a sudden we turned around and like the crowd is running after us. We felt like, the, oh my God, we're like the Beatles <laughs> <laughs> running to this car to get in the car, yeah. quick, get in the limo. Like help, and yeah. go, I mean, it was a love affair. It was yeah. so, it was so cool. That era, you know, everybody was in the club. Everybody was dancing. Everybody just, that music was so like, it's crazy to me because whenever they would put on that dun, 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 oh, yeah. everybody like ah, lose their shit and just yep. start screaming and dancing and jumping up and down and and i remember not too long ago when i, I finally went to see uh joya and ann and jeanette and when the song came on it was like one of those moments where i was like oh, it was outside was oh like, wow yeah that's our song so speaking and speaking about it being your song and, and, and sort of the evolution of how clubs worked, I was a teenager when I was a teenager in the 80s, I, I was DJing, you know, it was, was one, one of my ambitions to DJ parties and dances and ultimately clubs. So I started doing it as a young person, 14 or 15 years old. I had first I, I didn't have the Pantera version. I had the first Arista one, which was that black and blue kind of like yeah. uh, horizon or something on it there. And that's what I played. And you're right. I was DJing for young people at that point bonkers it wasn't on the radio yet but we got i had friends that were old enough to go to clubs or we'd go to record stores and say what's well, hot and they'd take things down from the wall take this you want this you know these 12 inch records yeah and so that's how i first had it i don't know honestly i'm trying to well i think i recall that at some point it's huge on the radio a few years later it sounded different to me but i don't think i knew why i probably assumed it was a remix or because some of the instrumentation right. was different but I never well, would have thought there was a whole changing of the guard. You tend to think that a group is the group. Yeah. So maybe we should talk about that. Why it wasn't the group? Well, so it was, you, yeah. there's a lot to it, right? You know, there was, back in the day, there was like people like Bob Rosenberg, who's from Will to Power. He was very close with us. And and there were DJs like that, DJ Samba, who, who would do these mixes on power 96 and they mm -hmm. would play it even though it was like in a power mix it was mixed in with a bunch of other stuff right. so it was kind of on the radio but it wasn't on the radio as like exposed or yeah or probably not the top 40 it was no some and back, sort of yeah, yeah. And back then it had to be the you had to have strong club play to get noticed right, right to yeah. get picked up so you know it was pretty grueling and the deal that we had with pantera records was not great mm -hmm. and uh you know i don't know how much I <laughs> yeah, to no. save it for this the screenplay that's coming out but no they were they re were really seriously underpaid and overworked and sure. it was difficult you know like you would go and it wasn't just like an easy show we were f dancing so we were our hair we come in and our hair was straight up like this right <laughs> by oh, the time be. that first show was like it was hanging down it was it was so <laughs> and it wasn't like easy you know like we had this amazing track and we sang live we didn't lip sync anything but there's no right. monitors we're working in nightclubs right mm, right sure. corded mics you know yeah. so we had, we were working it and we did the best we could and every time we went out like even in california when we would go out before we'd even start the show the fire department and the police were there because it was always oversold mm. there was times when we had to pull people up on stage i mean wow. It was great. It was super fun, but it was it was hard work. And so um, Ali at some point didn't really think that she wanted to continue. She was petrified of being on stage. It wasn't so much like once she got on stage, she was good. It was before that, you know, like I still get super nervous when I go on, but she would get to the point where she had so much anxiety about it and so worried about not being able to hear. And, you know, it's mm. super high. Mm -hmm. And not being able to hear and trying to sing on these beat up microphones. I mean, it's yeah. not like a, we were in theaters. Towards the end, we got into bigger places where we had better sound checks and we had a band and it was easier to perform. You know, as a performer, it's 
if you can't hear yourself, it's, oh, it's yeah. difficult. And so, and there was a lot, there were some issues with Sandra and I think she was kind of, I love her, you know, I love Sandra so much. She's not here to say her part of the story. Right. She's passed away for a couple of years now and it's, it's just breaks my heart. And recently I've been going out to perform as the original and doing the original versions of our songs. And it just, I miss them so much. I'm sure. still very friendly with Allie. So Sandra was going to leave and Allie wanted to leave. And I was going to be the only original one. And we had the album deal. So mm -hmm. we had done all these songs and we had laid down all the vocals, but Sandra is actually not on that exposure album. And then when we were out in California doing a show, there was a band called New Breeze sure. in a club and we saw them rehearsing. And I saw this girl, the lead girl, and I said to Allie, look at this girl. She kind of even looks like you mm -hmm. and she sounds great. She could be your replacement. So we really watched her and we watched her sing and we thought, you know, it was all, we were all excited about her. We told Lewis about her. That's Jeanette. Mm -hmm. So we actually got her the gig wow. yes. and uh, she, she, her version of it is, different. So she came in and Joya was singing in a band in Florida that we saw and she was great. So it was going to be Joya, Jeanette and me. And we had pretty much finished the album, but I didn't see Joya and Jeanette very much in the studio, mm. just a little bit because Allie and I were in there doing, because Arista wanted Allie who was singing on Exposed to Love. Right. It's an interesting story, right? Because the two incarnations are kind of on the exposure album, but the exposure album was, it's was so different. So at the last minute, the album was done. I had done all my vocals, all the background vocals with Ali and a bunch of other people and all the ad lib stuff that I did, all the air stuff, all the, ah, that was always me. Mm. Uh, that was my addition to the whole creation and amongst other things. And then, you know, we just, Frank and I had broken up at this point and a lot of stuff had gone down. And when we got the contracts were really not right. I wasn't happy with the contracts, the way that, that it would be two points divided between the three girls and they were paying us like a hundred bucks a show. Oh, wow. And um, maybe they would give me a little extra because I did all the laundry and I did everybody's hair. It took us like six hours to get ready. Sure. Oh, you know, it takes time to tease that hair up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. And full lashes and you know, face painting and the, the mm -hmm. costumes were all handmade. And I did it with Debbie Ohanian and I did all the hand painting on it. And, the, you know, and, and it was just, plus it was not very, they were not very supported, supportive, especially Frank would say, oh, any bimbo can do this shit. No. You know, it's like, a, and we were just, you know, having all these great, amazing shows and with, great adoration and sit for hours and sign autographs and, yep. and you know got the album deal and the tour and the band and the whole thing opening for lisa lisa and the cult jam and i found out that you know frank wasn't just with me and we mm. were engaged at that point i see so there was always two limos who's in the other limo <laughs> oh, sorry, and, uh, that's terrible yeah it was i was broken hearted and knowing that Allie was going to leave and I was there for Allie and I just loved her so much. I'm going to, don't get me all emotional now, Will. But it was, you know, it was very heartfelt. It wasn't easy. And I felt like, do I want to keep associating with these guys who are going right. to treat me like this and do right. this and do what they did to Sandra because they weren't telling her what was happening. And, you know, she was coming at me like, why haven't I been in the studio? What's going on? And we were forbidden and, and so I just felt like, you know, maybe it's better for the new girls if I just leave now so. than to make it be a continuous thing. And, you know, I somebody said to me, well, is it just sour grapes? Is that why you, you know, you're coming around? I said, no, because I've had a beautiful, wonderful career afterwards. I had my own dance company and then I was with Princess Cruises. Like I said, I traveled the world doing my one woman show as well as performing in all the big production shows. And I, I have loved it and have continued to be blessed and love my life. But it just seems like now there's so much work, right, for these groups. And I was approached to come out and I was 
working on a, on doing my story, not just about expose, it's featuring expose, but it's also about the whole thing, like you said, about the timing of being in the right place at the right time and what it takes to be in the business and why it's so important to be smart about making your deals and knowing how the music business works, that it's not just, you know, the artist pays for everything. I think it's the most surprising thing about this story is that ultimately the three of you walked away. I would have assumed it was, and again, like you, you had good reasons. They said they you fired had, us. Yeah, you all and had good also, reasons, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's some of the narrative on the internet, you know, depending on where you get your information, yeah. that you were fired or driven out or, or something like that had to be replaced. Or that we didn't have commercial success. Well, right. we got the album deal. Right. We were booked every weekend, like four or five shows, yep. you know, a weekend. So how is that not commercial? I mean, we worked a lot. So to say something like that, so it really kind of motivated me to say, you know, I'm not trying to take anything away from the girls now. They, you know, they've done incredible and they brought it to the next level. Who knows where it would have gone with the original lineup, you know, but uh, just tell the truth, you know. To... So I think it's an interesting story. And I think this is good that I'm saying this for me, for the original group and for the girls now. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to hurt anybody, you know, by coming out now, but I just think it's an interesting story. This is a hit song that was done twice. Yeah. And the CD, the pressing, there's half of the CDs that came out have Ali's version of Point in a Return and half have the new version. Right. That's yeah. cool. Like how many songs have two versions yeah. of the hit song that did that sold that many? Yeah, our friend Violet has the the original yeah her version of it and that's a version i use in my show i do the original version of love is our destiny which is completely different because Anne came in replaced me last minute because mm. they were already ready to go the album was done they were pissed because they had to go back in and re-record so they left all my background vocals they took my name off the album they put out cease and desist that i couldn't say because they were mad yeah it does feel like you know you mentioned the thing with frank and the two limos and that's terrible but it's i feel like even the way you're talking about the studios, it's almost like that. I feel like, you know, some of you are in one studio, some of you are in another, and it's, you don't have an idea of who's recording what because it's kind of done on the down low until, you know, deals yeah. are finalized. Jeanette, even when she, I saw her interview recently, she said, I don't even think they knew. I said, yeah, we knew, Sandra didn't know, but Ali and I knew what was going on, but I didn't think I was gonna leave. I yeah. was, you know, and I, yeah. So at some point, you know, so in 87, they re-record it. Um, obviously, that group goes on to find success in the late 80s, early 90s. Is there at some point where you feel, because it's so close in time, look, if it were me, I'd start, I don't know, you know, uh, replaying things in my head. Maybe I should have made a left when I made a right. Um, was there some point you have regrets that maybe you didn't stay with the group? Um, at the time... No. no, it was meant to be that way. But then when I started to look back to see if they were going to acknowledge, they never did until yeah. recently, maybe two years ago, yeah. acknowledge that we existed. We you know, it, could... it was only because it was written up in the Rolling Stone Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in their book. Yeah. It's documented in there about the original three. And then when I reached out to the expose apostle or wherever it is that website that the guy who was running that was not nice to me i was like you know i'm not trying to cause any trouble it's just that yeah well he should know right it's i mean what do you want to know what really i mean it's kind of cool the story is cool and yeah there's it's two completely different versions ali has this really sweet bell tone soprano voice yeah. she's very you know young in her singing at that time when she and that was like kind of the scratch demo vocal that she did mm -hmm. that they pressed you know oh. so i love that era of music so much of it sound so you know it was getting easier for people to make their own records because we were having synths and yeah digital recording things were getting a little less expensive and um there's so much freestyle music that sounds like people decided I want to make a record and it sounds passionate and it doesn't sound perfect, mm -hmm. but it's almost like the emotion is baked into it because it's not auto tuned and all digital right. and, you know, still some analog. Ali well, and I ended up singing yeah. on a lot. We sang on um, Will to Power's songs, Dreamin'. Right. That's and, you. Yeah. I've yeah. sung along with you. 
I didn't realize that at the time, yeah. Stay with me, don't ever go away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can really hear me yeah. on that. And we're on yeah. all the tracks on exposure. Uh, come yeah. go with me, come go. I mean, I always felt like they didn't really like my voice. I was like the one no. they liked the least because I was the most legit, you know, as I did mm. theater. But recently I've worked with Lewis and he said, are you kidding me? That's not true. I've never yeah. said that. You're on, listen to where you are sitting on every track just about. Mm. You know, by the way, as a side note, Come Go With Me is my favorite of the songs, I think. And because of that, I don't know, there's there's something more, I don't know, magical and romantic. It might just be where I was in my life at the time. Um, so, you know, you mentioned Lewis talking to him recently. It, it does strike me as curious, in the very least, that, look, Lewis started this with Frank and Frank's yeah. partner at the Pantera. Uh, Lewis wrote all the music, you know, he's, he's the behind that do, 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 He sat down, that came in his mind or his heart. Um, but he is, you know, we know he, he appeared at a recent performance of yours. Mm -hmm. How is it that you two are still friends and performing, appearing together? And it, he seems to have less of a relationship with the current. Yeah, they're not exposure. nice to him. <laughs> they don't What's really that? talk to him. Oh. They're nice to him. Because they, they associated him with, it was Ismael Garcia, Frank right. Diaz, and Luis Martinez, or Luis Martinez. And Luis was the producer, right? He was in the studio making music. He wasn't on the road with us. He didn't see what was happening on the road. He wasn't part of the putting the contract together and that whole right. big uh, feud that they had. They went to court, you know, to get the name. They didn't secure Frank and Ismael didn't get the trademark on XP right, Bay. Yeah. How can you yeah. not make sure that's not in place? Yeah. And so the girls and, you know, they didn't have much part in what the girls, you know, were working. I mean, who knew that, you know, now there would be so many 80s shows out there. If you look, there's a ton. Oh, yeah. There's a Absolutely. ton of work and the girls are working like crazy. I mean, they they had their attorney call me recently and take something down that because they said it looked like expose was going to be performing there even though it says laurie miller uh, hmm. so i had to rework it a little bit and i, I had to, you know luckily i had some good friends that helped me legally okay. so yeah. um i changed it i don't i'm not trying to hurt them yeah you know but uh i the fact that they've never spoken to me and the only time I did see Joya once, and Joya's been pretty cool, and she's the only one who really acknowledged me in the beginning and said, you know, we would have never be without you. But Jeanette, who she would never have this gig if it wasn't for Allie and I, um, you know, has never acknowledged that we've existed mm. until recently. Right. And I guess I get it, you know, and, and too, like they're just not so super friendly or welcoming or wanting to know anything about me other than I just don't say that you're expo original expose. I don't um, know. I have up to them. I can't. Like I mentioned earlier, we started this. I'm not looking to try to start any beef or static. Me neither. And, and definitely not between you and Lewis. But There's I enough shit going on in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cause any problems with you and Lewis. And I don't imagine I will. So I say that and it sounds very dramatic. But in, in researching to speak with you, I, I I came just happened to come across this Chicago Chicago Tribune article from 1987 where they interviewed Lewis, oh, really? and and already the way he tells the story is as if you guys didn't exist. Uh, yeah. The, sto the story is there was an audition held, hundreds of women came, and the three women selected were Jeanette, Anne, and Joya. Uh, so even by then I was <laughs> even knowing that you know we were going to talk to them. See, like, that's what really bugs me, because it would it'd be one thing if we were just like the studio singers and. But now he has a different story. Maybe you should interview him. Um, I'd be curious. Yeah. You know, I, I probably would reach I out to him. say because, that now. And, I, and yeah. honestly, he didn't remember a lot about it because he wasn't with us a lot. But he did. He was involved, of course. Right. But um, he wasn't out on the road. Well, I, w I wouldn't be surprised if this wasn't Arista or Frank and Ismail trying even, to get Even uh, Clive's book, which I know he didn't write. Yeah. The way he talks about us is so, it's not true. Yeah. Um, and he says that, you know, he just didn't believe in that genre of music. He didn't know anything about us or to say that we didn't have the it factor. I mean, if you look at our videos and our yeah. promo shots, you know, like I have it on my website, lauriemiller.com. I have all these vintage 
videos, the VHS oh, yeah. that I sort of transferred over of the original choreography. That was the only thing that I walked away with was like, and you can't use my choreography. The girls didn't want to, and Jeanette and Joy didn't want to get dressed and do all that stuff that we did. I thought it was such a huge part of it because yeah. we would have girls come and they were faces were painted and their hair was, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, we would have to get in the limo. We'd have to sit like way low like uh, that just so our hair would fit inside the car. You should open the sky roof or whatever it's called. <laughs> Stick your hair out to there. You know, um, mostly even though there was a lot of heartbreak and, you know, a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of people didn't know what happened. It was like such a love affair, the whole thing, you know, and it's right. and, I, and I'm about that. And if I and with my story, I'm not about to dog anybody or anything. I just want to tell the story. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting what happened. And, you know, it's got everything. Drugs, sex, rock and roll. <laughs> that sounds like the 80s right Record. there. Yeah. <laughs> Big hair, great costumes. The uh, yeah, and you know, I, I'm look. I'm so glad you reached out to me because I, I, I'm very much of the feeling that folks who deserve praise, who put in the work, should be recognized. And you know, it started with that post because I realized we had touched upon it a little bit on the episode where we spoke to the other ladies, and it occurred to me that you know it's not really known, and it should be known their actual story. Well, you know, they they don't have a their blood in it. You know what I mean? Like when I hear Anne talk and she says like, I don't even know why they say we're Latin. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh my God. You know, I mean, it came out of an era that was so full of passion and so full of heart and so full of Latino music. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, that's the driving force behind it. So, you know, when they were talking, I felt like, dude, yeah. <laughs> where's the... Yeah, it just didn't feel like, you know, they were, they, I don't, you know, how could they be? They came into like a moving train and just jumped on. Yeah, right. So let's cut to today, because like you mentioned, there's a lot of opportunities for 80s groups. You're now having an opportunity to go out there and sing, and we're so excited about that. Um, but also, I had learned that, uh, if I'm correct here, a record you recorded when yeah. you're during your solo career is being pressed again. How's that happen? Uh, and I yes. didn't do a thing to make that happen. It happened all by itself. So tell us about this. How? Yeah. Well, how did this come to be? What is well, the song? Right and yeah. Before I left the group, I was already doing stuff because I always did want to do my own thing as well, right? So I was working with Michael Morhong, and we had two songs called uh, "Love Is a Natural Magical Thing" and "Just for You." And my good friend Debbie Ohanian, who owned Meet Me in Miami clothing. She did a lot of our costumes. I would work with her, come in with sketches, and she would come up with stuff too. And we, we built all the costumes for Expose. And she was like, I, I'll back it. If I can sell clothes, I can sell records. Big mistake. Mm. So she did. She was the executive producer. Um, and we did the single of Love is a Natural Magical Thing. Um, and Bob Rosenberg did the dub version the dub mix we sat that's back in the day when he had a razor blade and tape and hand oh. splice that dub together if you hear it he's an artist man yeah. that that's just <laughs> we sat for hours together and i watched him do that it's my favorite part of it so recently these little small labels or dj labels were contacting me trying to look for a copy of that record wow. and i didn't have any to sell and I don't have any and Debbie had wet thousands got rid of them all mm -hmm. I don't know where they went they probably got destroyed so I had two different offers from different labels in Amsterdam Pasagi Records uh, and they wanted to do a short pressing of like 400 vinyl to for DJs again and so we I redid the album cover and we we I had the two inch tape so we went in and oh ingested them and um sent it to them and they they had somebody a good friend of theirs do a remix that i was so excited to hear but it's it's great it's just like an extended mix it's i wanted to hear them do something like with the dub more with the dub mm -hmm. and i had a guitar version of it so that's coming out in july i vinyl that's so like exciting. A DJ edition and there was like one version of it for on sale for 125 dollars a 12 inch single <laughs> wow. of love is a natural magical thing so it's been being played at festivals which is awesome when did it originally come out i 
came out in 1986 before I even um, okay. Well, there you go. okay and then you know it got squashed because mm -hmm. Frank you know did his thing and said don't help her oh I see hmm Frank you know get a new friends now and he's a minister oh. and he changed a lot he does a lot of things for the homeless people and you know it, it was just something that we went through and he kind of got lost in the whole fame thing and the whole I see deal with it and did a lot of things that maybe he's not happy about but you know he's a he's done a lot to change himself and you know i don't want to just make it out that he's just this horrible guy because he does a lot of really great things today he's not in the music business anymore right. but at the time you know we were all like sort of wrapped up in the yes the whole thing we've all been young and foolish yeah so is there anything, something you can promote? And then we'll just wrap this up. And um... Well, I have a show coming up okay. May 20th in Tampa Bay. Oh. Uh, I should know the venue, but it's on my site. And okay. it's on, I'm all over Facebook and Instagram and everything. And I've been promoting it like crazy. It's for a good friend of mine, uh, Zeke Ledesma from I Love Freestyle Music. He's the one who came to me. Nobody ever really asked me. I don't think most people really knew that I was around or that I was I don't know, viable, I want to say, you know, like yeah, that still dancing and singing and still, you know, you know, I'm old, right. old. <laughs> <laughs> Alive and kicking. Yes. Literally kicking. Like it's dance so kicking. fun to come out and just say thank you, you know, and it, mm -hmm. just thank you. And I, I, and I do say that in my show, like for supporting all the incarnations of expose and, and me getting to salute them. And I have this vintage footage of us wow. huge behind me. That's and awesome. it's, it almost seems like Allie and Sandra are with me. And I know Sandra has a huge fan base and Allie too. And Allie and I are still very close. She doesn't want to perform. I tried. God, mm. I would love to have her come out. But she didn't like it then. She's not going to like it now, yeah. right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but, you know, it was difficult then. It would probably be easier for us now with, you know, sound the way it is and everything. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm going to do that. And then there's a, another surprise show coming up. Okay. And um, yeah, well, we'll have, we could have folks. Well, I'll sure make sure I tell them to keep an eye on your website and your Facebook page. Yeah. Come so, see me, and I got T-shirts, and I got a T-shirt. I'm going to send one to you, yes. um, Will. That say the original has a picture of us on on the back of it, and uh, I've got pictures and everything. So I really want to see everybody, and you know, just have a good time and experience that, and see the original group and what it was like, and yeah salute lewis and frank and everybody who created it you know it's it's heartwarming to hear where you're at now uh that you know and obviously it's look it's been what 30 some odd year 35 years yeah. for you so we're i'm just ducking in i i remembered the music in 85 and now i'm ducking in where your life is now but it's just heartwarming to hear how healthy how happy uh how the perspective you have on it how you're still able to get joy out of this you know, sort of curious and challenging at times and, and, you know, obviously exciting and thrilling time in your life. It's, there's something very endearing about that. And I, I'm really grateful that you came on the show today to, to share the actual story so that uh, our fans know, and, and not only the true story, but also uh, so our fans know the story, period. Yeah. Yeah. Thank well, you so thank much you. for your time. Well, thank you. Well, thanks for being so cool and being so easy to talk to. I appreciate it.